Welcome everyone to not the round table, but rather the interview, what we're going to call the interview. One of the podcasts here at the American mind, our round table is our weekly podcast where we cover the news, cover the latest, uh, at the intersection of ideas and politics. But, uh, back when we first started podcasting, we were doing occasional interviews with scholars from the Claremont orbit about their books or about important topics, and we're going to revive that. So uh, I'm your host, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of the Claremont Review Books and the American Mind. And this is the first of what we hope will be many interviews forthcoming. This is with Mark Blitz, uh, an old friend of mine, uh, a teacher of mine at the gra- uh, in graduate school, an old friend of Claremont, and uh, an expert in political philosophy, or the, really the great works of political philosophy. Uh, over the last couple thousand years. Um, He's a scholar of Heidegger, of Nietzsche, of Hegel, of Plato, of Aristotle, you know, basically take any great thinker from the Western canon, a truly great thinker from the Western canon, and and Mark has has plumbed the depths. He has a new book out called Reason and Politics, and uh, this is my conversation with him. He, He gets into some concepts that are foundational to our public life together and to our regime here in America, whether it's freedom or the common good or uh, many concepts that have been much on the minds of of conservatives and even the new right these days. So I wanted to use the book as a jumping off point to talk about some pressing issues. And uh, this is truly uh, an original book, an original book of, of philosophy. And uh, but it's accessible at the same time. Mark has a great gift of taking words and concepts in their normal and everyday sense and then building on those and helping us to understand them in their depth and what they mean for reason and politics. So I hope you like the interview and uh, look forward to many more. Uh, well, welcome, Mark. Uh, thanks for coming in to talk with me about your your new book, uh, Reason and Politics, The Nature of Political Phenomena. We've known each other for many years. The, the book's wonderful. I commend it to everyone who are, anyone who's either theoretically interested or just interested in understanding their country and the Western tradition and, and truth itself. So c- congrats <laughs> on the book. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to uh, to help a general audience understand the, the point of a book like this. You know, I, I think the our, part of our lay audience will wonder, you know, why, why write a book, a sort of philosophical book like this, uh, you know, hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't, haven't the great thinkers sort of plumbed the depths of all these things? So why, why this book now and, and what's, uh, what's your ultimate purpose with it? Well, the ultimate purpose of a book like this is to uh, try to understand the truth of things. What is the true basis of rights, what's the true basis and meaning of freedom, what's the true basis of virtue and what's good. So the goal of really understanding things as they truly are is always the fundamental goal. And, you know, it's something that you have to do for yourself. You know, the fact that other people have listened to one of Mozart's symphonies doesn't mean that you shouldn't also. So I think it's, it's central to understand for yourself uh, there are also a variety of all these thinkers historically, so right. one needs to sort of come to grips with with what they with what they mean. Ultimately, there's also a practical meaning or a practical intention because if you can't really understand the truth of what's naturally good, or the truth of natural rights, or the truth and the limits of liberal democracy, uh, you're at risk uh, practically as well as as theoretically or intellectually. Mm-hmm. But you can't let those practical purposes drive uh, your attempt to understand things as they truly are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I will, that's just another recommendation of the book. You, you're, you of course, in conversation with the, the great thinkers uh, across the Western tradition. Um, and, and let me try to just run through all of them and see if I've missed anyone, uh, you, particularly in the footnotes. And you also... Uh, in the footnotes or the endnotes, I should say, have a wonderful um, literature review here and there on the great secondary stuff written on the greatest thinkers. So, I mean, broadly speaking, you're in conversation with with uh, Aristotle, Plato, Machiavelli, Kant, Hegel, Locke, Rousseau, yeah. Heidegger, and Nietzsche that's for the good. most part. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Some list. <laughs> so everyone should go out and read all those books. And uh, yeah. 
who's the audience for this book? I mean, you uh, we can sort of gather from what you said of what the purpose of, uh, of it is, but but who's your who's your main audience and maybe secondary or tertiary audiences? I think my main audience is uh, uh, other people who think about these issues, and so you know, professors, graduate students, and advanced undergraduate students. That's yeah. the that's the main audience. Uh, the secondary audience is anybody who's interested ultimately in understanding these concepts and understanding the bearing of these concepts on our political life. But the first and primary audience is the one I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's get into a, a few of the, the concepts in the book. And I, I'm not going to be exhaustive here, as you and I discussed just briefly before we started, but I'm interested in kind of uh, plumbing some of the the issues or the depths of the issues of that are embroiling our, our current political scene, one of which is uh, you talk a lot in this book about the American way of life or really about the ways of life uh, and how they're tied up in a regime or a culture. Uh, we'll get to the question of culture, but uh, I might we might start very broadly, a, a three-part question and we can take one uh, one at a time. But what, what was the American way of life at the founding? Good question. Um, <laughs> My view is that is that the heart of uh, the American way of life is equal natural rights. And uh, in many ways, uh, from a practical point of view, recovering the importance of equal individual natural rights is really the heart of our educational task. It's not the only task, but it's the heart of our task. So one of the things I attempt to do in the book is to lay out what those rights are, what their basis is, what's truly behind them and how one can understand such matters. So to me, that's the first and most fundamental element of the American way of life. And you know, you see it most clearly, obviously, laid out in the Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. and, and in Lincoln's uh, attempt to, to restore the importance of the Declaration of Independence as guiding America. But connected to that is a certain understanding of good things, a kind of equality of desire and equality of satisfaction of desire and connected to all this as well as the equal consent of the governed. So uh, to me, consent of the governed, equality of natural rights, and a certain understanding of what good things are, those are the fundamental elements. Mm -hmm. Then connected to that is a certain character, a certain set of virtues. I think the central one is responsibility, the kind of qualities you need in order to use your rights well. That's fundamental as well. So if you put together that character, the way on, in which each of us tries to rely on each other is having a certain character, a certain equality of goods, in, individual natural rights, and consent, that's the heart of the thing. I might add to that also the importance of religious toleration as a way to make real the, what you see in the First Amendment as free exercise and non-establishment. All of those things together seem to me to be the heart of the American way of life. Mm -hmm. What would you say about, I know that you, you're well acquainted with some of the more recent critiques from Pat Deneen and others of the liberalness, small L liberalness or Lockeanness of the founding, but I think contained in your answer are some real um, qualifications on um, the extent to which uh, the founding was uh, the, these critics would say the sort of heart of it was the, the, that uh, individual equal satisfaction of desire. You said, um, you know, what, what's good, and, and I think you, you didn't say ranking, but implied in that, and it's certainly in the book, the, the founders would have been well acquainted with the notion of ranking goods, ranking well or ill use of freedom. Uh, so I think one of the caricatures of... Um, of the founding has been to say it really all it is in this Lockean sense is the equal satisfaction of desire, however idiosyncratic. And that's part of the reason we've been led down this sort of leveling and, uh, and ever increasing, um, path of equality. What would you, what would you say to that? Or what are the grounds for thinking that the founders were, um, were more reasonable and less dogmatic and more, um, concerned with things like ranking of goods, excellence, et cetera, while, while of course, we, we recognize that it's the founding is, is not classical Athens. Well, I'd say two things. I mean, first of all, equal natural rights, equal individual natural rights are not the same as uh, equality in, in all satisfactions. It's a basic and fundamental equality, equal natural rights, but it doesn't mean that all things uh, 
equally satisfy all of the powers and capacities uh, of the human soul. Uh, it does mean that a certain direction towards the goods that we can share equally, a certain direction towards equal satisfaction of desire is something you see uh, uh, in our regime, but it doesn't mean that all goods as you choose yeah. them are equally good or equally high. And it's important to teach that together with equal natural rights. Uh, it's also important to see the importance of character and virtue. Uh, virtues are virtues. We have modern versions of these classic virtues of Aristotle, courage, liberality, moderation, and these newer virtues such as responsibility and toleration. And virtues are something which are not the same as the equal satisfaction of desire. They're a way in which you act, the way in which you pursue, and they open up to uh, higher and fuller versions of them. We're all to be responsible, but we all take on different degrees and amounts of responsibility. So it's a caricature to think of uh, the United States as meaning to be directed towards a kind of flat leveling of equality, um, although that critique doesn't come from nowhere because of the basis of the regime in equal individual natural rights. Yeah. I know you've written about it elsewhere. Um, you treat it just glancingly in the in the book, but what uh, could we let's just talk a little bit about as a tangent, but an interesting one. What do you mean by responsibility as a new virtue or a American virtue or a liberal democratic virtue? I, I discuss it in another book called Duty Bound, but yeah. describe it here as well. When I look at at in this book, when I look at modern virtues, I mean responsibility as the set of qualities which enable you to do your job successfully. I'm not thinking of guilt, mm -hmm. and I'm not thinking of excuses, I'm a, and I'm especially not thinking of excuses for failure. To be responsible is to do your best and to develop the qualities of discipline uh, and of judgment and of work that enables you to bring your activity to a successful conclusion. Uh, responsible people are the people you want to uh, hire, be partners with, you would like to be uh, have responsible people involved in your politics and political life. So that's how I mean responsibility. And the more responsibility you have ultimately, the wider and fuller your freedom. So there's a directedness of responsibility uh, from yourself to the family, to the neighborhood, uh, to the government and beyond. Our chief political figures are figures of uh, eminent responsibility who take on those responsibilities. But there's also something egalitarian about responsibility in the sense that in our regime, at least in principle, uh, every uh, job or task or office is open to everyone. Mm -hmm. And responsibility is a virtue you need in order to make use of that freedom in a successful way. The more you strip from people their responsibility, uh, the more constrained their lives will be and the less... Um, rich their use of their freedom will be. What's, uh, what's particularly liberal or modern about it? I mean, someone hearing this, especially not acquainted with the, the more formal discussion of, of, these, of this virtue that, that you've undertaken here and elsewhere, would say, you know, someone doing their job well and, and taking credit for it. I mean, that's not that's not new, is it? I mean, that existed in the ancient world, didn't it? <laughs> well, the ancient world had slavery sure, and, and inequality yeah. of women. Yeah. And it had... Um, no, the egalitarian part of it, of course, yeah, they did not have. Yeah, yeah. so I think that's, that, that's important, though, because it means that all sorts of, uh, of tasks, politically especially, but otherwise, are open to everyone. So the developing of this virtue, uh, the developing of this kind of excellence is particularly important. I mean, you might think of responsibility as a, a more democratic version of the great pride of the great soul of man in Aristotle. But to call it a more democratic version is to say a lot, yeah. because the equal emphasis is extremely important. And, you know, if you even look at the ancient aristocrats, uh, what were they uh, working hard at? Well, politics and political life, maybe managing their estates, but those who could do those things were limited. Right. They weren't CEOs. <laughs> they certainly were not CEOs, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, nor, was, nor were others 
aristocrats with them. So I think yeah. there's there's a connection. There has to be a connection between the classic goods and the classic virtues and the modern goods and the modern virtues. There's not some sort of unbridgeable gap. But to say that there's a connection is also not to say that they're precisely or exactly the same either. Right, right. Yeah, so the um, the democratic analog and responsibility of, of greatness of soul would be doing your job well, taking pride in doing your job well, and using that competence and that responsibility as the stepping stone for, as you say, wider areas of responsibility and growing growing reasons for pride in doing your job well, right? Yes, that's yeah. exactly right. So the fullest responsibility in something like our country would be the fullest politics and fullest political life. Still look a little different from great pride because yeah. what you have is open to others. You don't have party competition in exactly the same way. You don't have technology. There are lots of things you don't have, but the fullest responsibility is not that far away from the fullest great pride. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I wanted to talk about the, well, actually, let's finish our discussion of uh, my three-parter. So, <laughs> yeah, so the American way of life at the founding, we've discussed that a bit. Uh, what would you say, and, and these things are always in flux, so we, we don't need to talk about some end point, but we're in the midst of it. But what is the American way of life now? as opposed to the founding? Well, the American way of life is, is, is what it is, but it's changed to a degree in the, in the following way. Our understanding of liberty and our understanding of equal rights is fundamental, but it also changes a bit over time. So many of the dominant views now of, uh, of liberty and of equal rights are not the same as they were uh, at the founding much more emphasis now on group rights, ethnicities, identities, many arguments that you can't give a rational defense of equal natural rights. So a different view of liberty and who has it and what it means uh, is beginning to take hold. That's why I think the basic teaching of the fundamental meaning and justification of equal natural rights is so fundamental. And together with that come all sorts of under, other understanding of quality and equality and an odd combination that we have of, on the one hand, the wish not to call some things better than other things, but on the other hand, this kind of aggressive assertiveness of what one is as opposed to others. So for me, the heart of the changes in the American way of life, not the only thing, but the heart is a, a changed understanding among many of what liberty is. And therefore, as in so many cases, poor education over time yeah. is the root of lots of difficulties. So as you well know, uh, here at the Claremont Institute, we like to talk about uh, the transformation of this understanding. It's a long story. It's not, uh, it's not clean, but what what are the who are the major drivers in terms of thinkers or or maybe even um, broader movements, uh, both intellectual and political, of this change? In your opinion, well, they're important facts as well as thinkers, and yeah. I think it's both of those things together. So you know, th think of John Locke as the the uh, the most significant uh, thinker behind the understanding of equal natural rights that you see in the Declaration, um, and more or less what happens in from the end of the 18th century on uh, are many arguments which claim that the most important things about human beings are not natural in the sense of unmade by us, somehow covering all of us and essential to us, but rather are historical. They change, they come and go, or another thought, they come and never go, but nonetheless, they come into being and are not natural. And some of that thinking starts with uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you see versions of it in Hegel. You see, of course, great versions of it in Nietzsche. And some of that, not all, connects itself to uh, notions of the importance of class or the importance of historical period or the importance of, of ethnicity. So intellectually, some of what's behind what we have now starts then. And I think particularly uh, you can see some of it rooted in Nietzsche's thought and in the thought of later followers of Marx, Karl Marx obviously was also part of that original group that I mentioned, but some of his later followers, the critical theorists, hence some connection to critical race theory. 
And then some of the 20th century thinkers too, most significantly Martin Heidegger, whom I've studied and who right. I write about in this book. That's there intellectually. And it then also leads to a changed understanding of the meaning of the Constitution, and especially a changed understanding of equal natural rights, no longer seen as something that you can rationally defend. That's a big element of the change. But then there are also facts on the ground, as they say, industrialization, large-scale immigration, the closing of the frontier. Mm -hmm. You know, they lead to certain problems of work conditions, of employment, of unemployment, of poverty, which a healthy country needs to deal with. So both that changed understanding and some of those problems, you begin more or less at the turn of the 20th century to pick a date mm -hmm. uh, with progressivism of the old school <laughs> and then on through the, the New Deal. And then all this is connected to this changed intellectual understanding, which weakens the view of the naturalness and defensibility of equal rights and which defends or teaches these um, historicist understandings that you see in, uh, in critical theory of, of various sorts. And as I say, it's sort of this odd combination of relativism and assertive separatism. <laughs> and that's part of where we are. Mm -hmm. It's not that we're completely there. You right. know, we have our resources. We have our equal natural rights. We have our constitution. We have lots of political opposition. So not to despair, but certainly to worry. Yeah. I want to get to this question of, um, of will and historicism. But first, just, just for markers for folks, is it fair to say that the earliest and most systematic critic of Locke was Kant? Kant is both a critic and not a critic yeah. of, of, of Locke. I mean, if you look at Kant's politics, there's a lot in the political communities that Kant prefers, which is similar to what you see in liberal democracy. Right. But it's also the case that the defense of equal morality or moral universality in Kant is not based on uh, equal natural rights. It's not based on nature. It's based on a certain understanding of the will. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's fair to say that but there's still a lot of connections in between the political community he liked or favored yeah. and a Lockean community. And then is it also fair to say that the, the deepest and most radical critic of liberalism is Nietzsche? Yes, I think yeah. that's fair to say. Among, yeah. among, among those thinkers who are thinking about politics and morality and religion and think of themselves to be doing that, I would say Nietzsche is the most mm -hmm. deep and radical critic. Yeah, and then just to... It's just for signpost reasons, yeah. Kant, Kant writes, is writing right around the ratification of the Constitution, among other times, right? And then Nietzsche, what, 65, 70 years later? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Nietzsche's basic works were written in the 1880s, yeah. some earlier, but right. the, one, the really right. yeah, the central ones in the 1880s. Good. Well, we discussed about the, uh, we discussed the American way of life at the founding, um, the transformation of it uh, and the current way of life. I just want to, I wanted to read this long poll quote. It's the only one I'll do here, but it, I just it was it was wonderf wonderfully put. Uh, it's it covers this whole waterfront. And then if you had any concluding thoughts about this segment, uh, we can uh, we can move on to maybe a, a deeper discussion of culture. But this is in your section on culture and opinion. You, you you say the following, or you write the following: Our movement in the United States has been toward converting equal natural rights to equal civic rights, and then toward equal or identical treatment of others privately as well as publicly. Liberty becomes simple self-assertion with a diminishing grasp of its original limits, conditions, and justification, its connection to pride of ownership and economic growth rather than to oligarchic accumulation, to industriousness, responsibility, and toleration rather than approval, to earnest faith, genuine art, serious thought, and science, and to political deliberation. Public discussion is increasingly governed by a presumption in favor of the identical respectability and availability of all modes of living that do not question this equal propriety. Such notions make proper distinctions difficult to state and defend publicly. Distinctions are seen only as assertions of power. And then this concluding paragraph, which I thought um, is, uh, is apt and very interesting given our, our current wealth inequality and, and the perception, I think rightly in many instances of... Uh, of the, the kind of commanding heights of, of uh, cultural and um, economic power being sort of isolated or unassailable and, and um, insular. 
you write uh, to conclude this section or almost conclude it. This difficulty with making reasonable distinctions also means that a vacuum occurs into which assertions of special status thrust themselves publicly by various groups or more quietly by those who seek to maintain oligarchic privilege. The result is our peculiar current American combination of growing egalitarianism, the rise of assertively intolerant groups, and the attempt by some to freeze in place their unequal status and wealth. I still stand by that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting, you know, the, um, this phenomenon of woke capital, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, it's one of these terms that ar arose on social media and has now kind of entered our, at least the elite conversation about politics. And uh, it's fascinating, the, the, the phenomenon of, you know, someone like, you know, Larry Fink of BlackRock, you know, using the sort of the language that came out of the academy about group privilege or white privilege and identity, uh, the, the, the absorption of that language by our, by some of the richest people in the country running our large corporations and its dissemination through their ranks, through HR departments, uh, coupled with uh, what seems to be the universal desire of many of their millennial and Generation Z employees to, to, uh, to have this be a huge priority for for uh, corporations. It seems we've come a long way from the 60s in that sense. You know, back then you had student radicalism, uh, you, you, the campuses were, were beginning to be radicalized in a more aggressive fashion. But it seemed like at the time, uh, you know, the major corporations and the capitalists, so to speak, just thought all this was a bunch of nonsense. Maybe you had to put up with it, but they they certainly would have gone wouldn't have gone whole hog, let alone maybe shown the creativity to use it as a vehicle for amassing greater wealth. Yeah, you know, you can add to this list uh, the intelligence community, yeah. the CIA. I mean, that was <laughs> right. that was always the uh, the institution most attacked in the in the in the late sixties and onward, and uh, to see them somehow believed in everything they say and to have now begun a kind of woke advertising and training is even more peculiar, you could say, than what you would say uh, about the, the, the corporations. You know, even in the 1970s, when versions of this began, I think, one would always wonder why people, let's say law school professors, who thought they had their positions in some sort of unfair and unearned way didn't simply give them up and let other people take right. them. They never did give them up, nor do they now give them up, nor do these uh, woke capitalists give them up. That's the kind of thing which leads you to think that this activity belongs to, if it's not exclusively, but belongs to an attempt uh, to stay where they are mm -hmm. and to freeze themselves into place to the degree to which they can. I don't know these individuals, so this could be untrue about any particular individual, but I think it belongs to that. It's also connected, however, to this miseducation that people had. In the, in the late 60s and early 70s, people leading institutions had been educated in a much different way about American principles. Uh, many of them, of course, had, had, had defended that our way of life in the Second World War, but all were educated in, in a different way. So what was happening struck them, I think, in a deep way as wrong, even if they were against the Vietnam War, which is kind of the immediate cause of, of, of some of these difficulties. Now they're all educated in a different way. So combined with um, maleducation is this, I think, wish to find a way of staying on top and freezing themselves into place. And that's where one is because it'd be perfectly easy, at least I'd think, for some of these places uh, to find other employees to replace the ones who are most annoyed at their not being woke. Mm -hmm. If you take something like the New York Times, you know, if you have 50 employees or 100 employees or 200 employees, who say, well, they don't want the newspaper to go in a certain direction. Uh, otherwise, they'll leave. Let them leave. <laughs> there are 2,000 people who would love to have those, those kinds of positions. Even in the New York Times, where the publishers were always to the left, there are much more to the left now. And the check on the newsroom that would come from the publisher has largely disappeared. Yeah. So 
there's a big degree of miseducation uh, together with what I still think is, a, is a, an attempt to stay where they are as long as they can. Yeah. No, you talk to um, some people who've worked in corporate America over the last few decades and or even the last 40 years. And yeah, in the 70s, you had, you had a, a wide variety of educational backgrounds for the C-suite down to, you know, the 25-year-old, you know, they could have gone to University of Georgia or, or, uh, or some state school out in Arizona or whatever. But now I, I hear from, from uh, people who've, who've worked there, you know, at a place like Citigroup or BlackRock or take your pick, Goldman, wherever, or even these consulting firms, you know, everyone under 40, let's say, it's not completely true, but rather than having that older diversity of background, Almost all of them went to Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, or Yale, or some, you know, Williams or something, if yeah. you want to slum it at the liberal arts college. Yeah. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> no, um, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there's a, I mean, I don't know the specifics yeah. in any of yeah. these particular firms, but it's generally the case that there's a nationalization of the education of um, uh, people who have uh, real skills uh, intellectually. Uh, good grades, high scores, and the things which still count, let's hope at least they continue to count over right. the next 20 years, we'll see a much greater nationalization. You had a much wider regionalization. You had a lot of students with real excellence who would stay home, who would stay in their state schools. Yep. So I think that's, that's quite true that as best one can tell, there's this kind of concentration in a few places. It's true also of journalism. I mean, but in journalism, you would go back even further. You know, journalism was a kind of middle or lower middle class occupation, yeah. a lot of it anyway. Yeah. Now it's become you, you what were making you said six also. figures when you were 20, 28. You yeah. weren't making yeah. six figures, and you weren't you weren't there looking at the police blotter uh, after you'd gone to Princeton or Harvard, and you weren't covering sports, uh, <laughs> and you weren't uh, devising all of these. Uh, interesting mathematical ways of making decisions. It was a different world, I think, in a lot of journalism too. So, and that's of course such a central uh, cultural institution as well. So there is a kind of narrowing, a class narrowing, a background narrowing in that sense. It wouldn't as matter as much, however, if people were educated uh, in a better way, in a different way and a broader way, and a way which enabled them really to fairly test their own judgment and their own minds. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, you've, been, you've been teaching for a long time now. You've seen the change of the academy from when you first became a professor. Where was your first teaching gig? I guess it was at Harvard, right? In graduate at Harvard, school. Yeah. As an assistant professor. As yeah. assistant professor, yeah. So to get back to one of the great ancient uh, political philosophers, Aristotle, I mean, he makes a point in the politics of, you know, any competent uh, regime, and especially its leadership, will look to lean against the worst tendencies of its regime and its educational system, broadly speaking. We don't, we're not just talking about colleges or K through 12, it would have been a foreign concept to the ancients in, in a certain sense. But what, what's our path back in a way, or, or what's the best correcting we can do? What, what sorts of education should we be pursuing, especially at the, at the elite level in the sense of at the cream of the crop? The sorts of education are easier to think through than how you actually deal with the institutions. Yeah. Uh, the sorts of education are a, a sound teaching in uh, the basic American founding texts, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalists, some of the basic thinkers, and the founding texts of political philosophy, which enable you to really think through and judge the adequacy of, of, of our regime, our way of life, which enable you to understand the limits that you can expect from politics. So I think the sound education from that point of view and the sound education from a literary point of view, lots of Shakespeare, lots of classics, and a sound exposure to some great art and music, all that I think has not changed. And if it does mean that there's a constricting of what's taught about the immediate contemporary world, so be it. When you're talking secondary school and, we're, and when you're talking uh, uh, colleges and undergraduate education and universities. The difficulty is that the major, most prestigious institutions have become what they've become. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely difficult to turn around such institutions. 
So therefore, one needs to continue to pursue all of the alternative modes of education, which have grown up in the past 20 years already, right. to begin to deal with this. It's very hard to see how else one, one could do this without something immensely radical. I mean, one could imagine the board of trustees of one of these institutions turning over completely. One could imagine such a, a board making different kinds of demands about the hiring and firing of faculty. One could imagine that happening while the school still retained its prestige and was still a magnet for the most excellent. But that's a lot of heavy imagining. <laughs> right? And uh, yeah. it's something where I think you don't expect that to happen. What you're trying to do there is prevent the worst from going on. Or if you happen to be fortunate enough to teach in a really excellent institution, to be honest in the way you teach and the, and the questions uh, that you ask. You know, if everyone pursued the truth as they understood it, spoke it in a prudent way when they had the opportunity, lots of institutions would be better. Hmm. But a wholesale change is very difficult given yeah. the nature of our, our current leading institutions, at least educationally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one reason for hope, and I, I think the possibilities opened up by it have probably been accelerated in people's imagination by spending a year educating on Zoom, is, you know, technology offers certain remedies to this. Uh, it's not perfect. I... I just to take one example that I was surprised by the other day from uh, my colleague Arthur, who's in contact with somebody about it, but and this is a, this is kind of a narrow example. But Liberty University teaches, I think, fully online undergraduate that has an option of fully online, and they have one hundred and twenty thousand students, <laughs> which is a remarkable thing. They're not quite teaching, I don't think, you know, the pure founding doctrine. I think they're a little more religiously inflected, to say the least. But that sort of thing uh, offers some reason for hope, I should think. Sure, as does at the at the secondary level and even the grade school level, yeah. uh, all sorts of school choice programs, charter school programs. Homeschooling has taken off, yeah. I mean, or exploded, really. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those things, I think, are true. The, the most difficult thing is the, the chief and most prestigious institutions, the ones uh, considered to be the most excellent, because that will always, those will attract really excellent students. Yeah. And unless they self-destruct somehow, um, then they'll always be a lore. And uh, therefore, I think there'll, there'll be a certain limit to these flanking maneuvers, you might say. Mm -hmm. uh, though in time, uh, the prestige of those institutions might fall or the openness uh, to other institutions might rise. All of that, all of that could certainly happy, happen. Yeah. But I think all of these flanking maneuvers are are very intelligent and and important things to do. Yeah, the que yeah one of the questions about how quickly they'll discredit themselves is how much they give over to identity based education rather than excellence based education. And you suspect, at least for now, uh, savvier parts of of that of say the Ivy, you know, the, the very height of American higher education are much like the, the height of American corporate life. They know they got to throw some meat to this identity politics thing. And it, it even is threatens to take over large parts of their institution. But they know if they lose that commitment to educating the very best, that, I mean, they're going to have to fall in prestige eventually, right? They're certainly going to, one thing they certainly will do is try to choose the most excellent um, from a wider variety of students. So though it may be that they will be taking some people, because they've been doing this for a long time, who by certain scores and standards uh, are not as good as some others they don't take, nonetheless, I would doubt that they'll be looking for anything but what they think are the very best within the various groups as they, yeah, sure. as they divide things up. Um, and then if this reaches some point where they've divided things up in such a way that uh, they're really losing too many of the students they think are truly excellent by any measure whatsoever, yeah, then I think they'll slow down or reverse course a little bit, whatever they say or don't say. But I could be wrong about that, right? And w one can always be wrong in, in, in these predictions about what uh, institutions will do. Yeah.
Well, let's. Um, I want to offer up a, a widely uh, bandied about phrase um, and see what you think of it because I know you you wrote not about it specifically, but you you wrote interestingly, intelligently, and deeply about this in the book, especially the first half. This question of culture. So we often hear uh, it's widely attributed to uh, Bright, Andrew Breitbart that culture that uh, politics is downstream from culture. What do you make of that <laughs> that saying? And, and should it be any sort of guide for conservatives or people on the right? I mean, it's more reasonable, I think, to say politics to some important degrees downstream from education mm -hmm. um, because culture in the sense in which people, I think, mean it when they say that is itself largely downstream from education, both uh, some co a combination of moral or ethical education and intellectual education. So if I had to pick a phrase along those lines, that's what I'd say. And... Um, it also gives, in a certain sense, more hope because it's not as amorphous as culture. Education, as we were just saying, you can see is in, in certain institutions, in the family, and so on. It's a question of what culture is, and yeah. that's something which has been discussed for a long time. Does culture largely just mean a particular way of life in a place with these particular habits, this particular history, this particular religion? There's obviously some element of that. Um, to me, culture ultimately means you can, it's a combination of moral education and intellectual education. The heart of changes in culture, not the only thing, is what we were discussing a while ago. The change in understanding of the basic governing principles of the way of life, that I think is really the heart of things. So our changing understanding of what uh, liberty means, of what equal rights mean, of what virtue means, of what excellence means, our changing understanding if there even should be such things, our changing understanding. That, to me, is what ultimately drives moral and political culture, mm -hmm. and to some degree, intellectual culture. Intellectual culture, to some other degree, also has a kind of life of its own, because not everything is political, or not everything is encapsulated within politics. But nonetheless, it's also very much um, impacted by um, what changes in, the, in, in moral and political understanding. So I would say the understanding of the basic and the changing understanding of the basic principles of the way of life, that really to me is the heart of culture and changes in that, the heart of changes in culture. There are other things also, of course, involved. Right? Yeah. in terms of habits and traditions and what you remember and memories and so on. But that's, I think, really the heart of things. Mm -hmm. so the question of setting up a culture like that. Um, so, so constitution creating and foundings really are the, are the, the taproot of, of a lot of what we've been discussing. In the regimes which have a, yeah. a distinct and clear constitutional founding. They are the taproot and then the, the understanding of those principles. That I, seems to me to be the taproot, at least morally uh, and politically, and to some degree, intellectually as well. Though, as I said, intellectual life, philosophic life, has a certain life of its own, mm -hmm. not simply reducible to what happens morally and politically. To me, that's really the heart of culture and changes in culture rather than uh, facts such as uh, demographics or historical period or the substance of the traditions and so on. What is the dominant way of life in a place like the United Kingdom? Is it the list of kings? <laughs> is it the list of these traditions? It's not that not even exactly the territory, because that's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. It's their basic governing principles and the way in which the, uh, they understand them. That's, to me, the heart of, of things there as well. And culture is that, as it exists at any particular time, it's the kind of choices people make and who make them at a particular time, given their understanding of justice, mm -hmm. given their understanding of equality, given their understanding of liberty. And therefore, ultimately, that understanding, I think, is the most important, though obviously not the only important fact. Yeah. No, that, that's an excellent way of thinking about it. I wanted to just discuss a couple more things, and then we can, we can uh, wrap up. Um, one is, we, we alluded to it, or, or you did, I, I would be... Uh, not doing my duty if we didn't talk a little bit about Heidegger and Nietzsche and the, and the uh, 
uh, not, we don't need to get into the, you know, the formal philosophical aspects of them necessarily, but to what extent do we find our current obsession with identity, uh, critical race theory as much in the news these days, uh, as many states try to ban its teaching, um, the Trump administration tried to, um, you know, ban what they call racial scapegoating and the, and the training sessions that were going on this, uh, this critical race theory and its, and its antecedents intellectually came out of the academy and have seemed to spread to HR departments across government, uh, both state, local and federal, and then across many corporations. But, um, can we trace this back at all to, um, to thinkers, to, to some of the most important thinkers of the last century or century and a half? Sure we can. I mean, what a remarkable thing that the racial equality based on individual freedom and rights that had become such a fundamental basis of this country, certainly concretely from uh, the civil rights revolution of the 50s and 60s until recently. What a remarkable thing that that so much seems to be overturned that people not only uh, are allowed to think in terms of different racial groups, but are encouraged to think in terms of different racial groups, and not only encouraged to think in terms of different racial groups, but often mandated mm. to think in terms of racial groups. It's really um, a very deeply disappointing turn of events. Well, it has some of its roots intellectually in this thinking in terms of historical period, economic class, different ethnicities, um, especially as race and ethnicity um, becomes uh, the fundamental category that people want to think in terms of. Obviously, it has something to do with gaining advantage for oneself and one's group. It's always a mistake not to see that, right. but why one would think in these terms and why one would think it's valid to think in these terms also has its, its intellectual roots. You can see it to a degree in thinkers such as Nietzsche, though Nietzsche was, uh, would not really base himself on uh, uh, any kind of ordinary biological racism. You can see it in a lot of race thinking in the old progressive sure. movement. Um, but you can see it as well in the kind of attempt to think of society and politics as the clash of different groups seeking power, different groups, different classes, different identities, different ethnicities. And that's clearest, you might say, in Karl Marx, as it then turns itself from economic class to race identity of other sort, ethnicity, and so on, hence critical race theory. So if I had to locate it in one place, I'd locate it in this view that the assertion of power is fundamental. You can locate that in a way in Nietzsche. I always say in a way because sure. it's not the full yeah. thinker. You can connect that to this discussion and thought always in terms of groups and classes that you see in Nietzsche. But then when you push away, in a way, the economic element of it and add this other element, you see it. And you wouldn't see it so forcefully again if people understood uh, both the truth and the limits of, uh, of, of equal natural rights and equal, and equal individualism. So it's, um, it's a very disturbing turn of events, but it has its intellectual roots of the sort that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention Heidegger, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, I, I don't because, mean to pick because, on him overly, but... <clears throat> because I think for, these, for this kind of argument, you don't need to go sure. to Heidegger. Heidegger supported the Nazis, and his way of thinking and understanding made race of a sort relevant in, when thinking in terms of a people generally, not biological racism, but race of a sort. And his support of the Nazis was connected to his thought and to his thinking, but I think you don't need simply to, to go to Heidegger if you go to Marx and Nietzsche together. Sure. That, I think, is sufficient. But Heidegger's own thinking was in, in, about politics yeah. was based on, in many ways, the people, 
uh, the people as uh, some combination of historical and racial group. So if you were looking to uh, understand politics uh, in a healthier and more reasonable way, you would look away from Heidegger mm -hmm. as well as looking away from <laughs> these other thinkers. Yeah. That I would certainly say. No, and I should um, – you've discussed it elsewhere, including in just the public prints, uh, Weekly Standard, uh, back when it still existed and elsewhere. Uh, this question of Heidegger and his his politics and his philosophy, and you, you do a wonderful job, succinct job in this book as well. So everyone should um, should go there if they're interested in that question. But and then there are the third and there are some third and fourth rate Heideggerians, sort of Foucault and others, right? Or, or the, the, well, intellectual descendants in a way who who talk about authenticity, identity, and all this stuff, right? Sure. Yeah. There and there, there are, you know a lot of people who who uh, learn from Heidegger, but they also learn from Nietzsche and, Nietzsche, yeah. and Heidegger's understanding of Nietzsche. So it's always complex. Another central figure in many ways, still in my mind, though more so in the late 60s, was Herbert Marcuse. Yeah. Marcuse is both an, a Marxist and a student of Heidegger. Right. And you know, that's an interesting, an interesting combination. On the other hand, again, if you look at the actual political movements you see now, they're certainly not as intellectually well grounded, let's say, as the movements of the '60s, for no. better or worse. But they're, you know, they may yeah. mention names, but the level, of course, of understanding would be very different, I think. And the way in which this kind of assertion of uh, group politics uh, of ethnicities is a matter of the assertion of power is, I think, pretty clear. Yeah. Um, so that one wouldn't want to over-intellectualize the basis of yeah. these things. There's an assertion of power in a vacuum, as I've said, which one has to be serious about recognizing and dealing with. Yeah, that was going to be just one follow-up, you know, uh, that I came to mind. Yeah, especially the, you know, folks who don't spend a lot of time reading in the great tradition and are, are long out of school will wonder, you know, really, I mean, some, uh, nobody, nobody, all these, none of these people read Heidegger, let alone maybe they picked up snippets of Marcuse's repressive tolerance. But, you know, is it really the great philosophers who drive all this? Or is it, I mean, you, you've conceded that it's a lot messier, but how should we think about that relation? It's a lot messier, but it's real because after all, the American founders' understanding of equal natural rights had a lot to do with their understanding of John Locke and of other thinkers mm -hmm. of the 18th century. We're a kind of unique regime in that sense, but nonetheless, extremely important. The Marxist regimes would hardly exist without Karl Marx, though right. you can't yeah. simply reduce them to yeah. Karl Marx. And even fascism, uh, some of the intellectual um, material and thinkers around it were not merely window dressing, mm -hmm. but the, they're, they're, a lot of the anti-democratic, anti-egalitarian, anti-liberal democratic views came from these thinkers. So cases differ, but if you look at those regimes, the intellectual basis counted for a lot. And I think that was certainly so also, at least in the late 60s and early 70s, that change mm -hmm. in the United States on that part of it. Um, less so now maybe, but nonetheless still there. Less so now because it's all spread out yeah. into all the colleges, or almost all of them, too many of the secondary schools, the woke capitalist office, the woke offices and big corporations that you've mentioned, yeah. and human resources department. So it's all spread out and thinned out, but a lot of it still goes back to that, but not all of it. Right. That's, 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 that's to forget politics as politics. Sure. Yeah. Now, people appropriate these things for... for their own advancement and, the, and their own enrichment. Right. They yeah. both believe them in some cases and, and are driven by them and also appropriate yeah. them for their own advancement. Yeah, and, and the, the breadcrumbs, as it were, uh, that we see all around us now are all these weird jargony terms, right? You know, we all feel like we're living on campus now, uh, <laughs> or, you know, from the from the your local ethnic studies department or even corrupted humanities department. You know, you, you alluded to this... Uh, 
the woke CIA, or really alluded to this ad that we all saw in the last yeah. couple of days, a recruitment video, it seemed like, of a, a kind of, for lack of a better term, a wise 35-year-old Latina who was, as she called herself, cisgendered, uh, who uh, who found a good home at the CIA. Uh, it was very odd. It's, an odd, it's an odd way to recruit for the CIA. But, <laughs> but what's also odd is that, you know, as I said, in the late 60s and during the Vietnam period, the last institution of uh, people on the left would would pay serious attention to as someone to trust and believe would be the CIA. I mean, starting earlier, I'm sure, but visibly during the Trump administration, anything said by anyone who had some connection to the CIA, which you chose to believe because it was useful politically, they all believed and acted as if it's true. That, that's, that's a pretty remarkable change as well yeah. in the credulousness or decision to be credulous among leading journalists and even some academics. Big change from 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, to say the least. Well, let's, um, let's finish on, uh, a, with a discussion of something much on the minds of, um, I think, conservatives of certain stripes these days, uh, certainly young people interested in the judiciary and, and other things. Um, they're... This notion of the common good, uh, common good originalism. These are <laughs> these are critiques from the right of a certain kind of, uh, as they see it, procedural antiseptic um, liberalism, uh, in, or over overly judicialized liberalism. And one of the critiques from again Pat Deneen or Adrian Vermeule is is to to bring the common good back into currency. Now the critics of this view from say the libertarian right. A, they treat it as wholly new and, and um, quasi-totalitarian in a way, disregarding the fact, among other things, that um, you know our old friend, now dearly departed, Harry Jaffa, was, he wouldn't put it in terms of common good originalism, but he was going after a, 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 a sterile proceduralism 30 and 40 years ago, if not um, earlier than that. But how should we understand the common good in a liberal democracy? How should we understand the common good in America? Does it, is it, stand, does it stand opposed to individual natural rights? Uh, can we understand them together? Yeah, that's a good question yeah. um, and an important question. I have a chapter in, the, in, in this book uh, on uh, common and commonality and different understandings of what's common. And I have a chapter on, on the good and what's good and how you can think about it. But Part of that chapter also, and a, and a large part of it, is to try to understand why what's good is always in dispute and disputable. What about the nature of what's good uh, leads it to be disputed, even though you can make, of course, judgments ultimately about what to do. So I mean to open up all of those questions uh, intellectually. I also mean to really try to think through this question of how can equal natural rights be true but also different degrees of excellence and different degrees of what's good. How can they both be true and put together? And what are the limits of being able to put those things together politically? So intellectually, that's a, a, an important element of, of, of what I'm trying to think about in, these, in, in the book. Politically speaking, if we're grounded on equal natural rights, that needs to be taught and defended. It isn't simply going to happen automatically. It's got its basis in certain truths about human will and choice and deliberation and thought. But education uh, in such things needs to be something that the community as a whole concerns itself with. The community could concern itself with it by deciding that school choice and homeschooling and so on is the way to get that done or a good way to get that done. But it's still a kind of communal decision. Uh, virtue of character doesn't simply arise individually. It needs to some degree to be advanced by law, by education. An equal or reasonably equal or non-monopolistic economic marketplace doesn't just happen automatically. Mm -hmm. One needs to regulate in various, in various ways. So with an eye on an opening for excellence and the advancement of uh, equal natural rights and the character of responsibility and other virtues that can most use them, those, I think, have an element of, of common 
task and common choice, even if you ultimately decide the best way or a good way to deal with those as a people as a whole is by allowing a, a larger degree of, of individual or private activity that you might otherwise. In terms of the Supreme Court, I mean, one of the turns towards uh, a, a kind of legal conventionalism occurred because the people who talk in terms of principles of justice came to conclusions one didn't want. Right. Those were the, the, you know, it's the people on the left who made those kinds of judgments or who found things in the Constitution one didn't think yeah. was there. And therefore, as a kind of prudential decision, it seemed better to some to simply limit themselves that way. That's one thing to, yeah. to say. The, right. The, the fear of runaway Brennanism on the right or just everywhere, right? Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. rather than runaway Brennanism, let's just cabin the whole thing and limit it in a various yeah. way in our teaching. You can also see that in a doctrine of original public meaning, there's some of that as well. But since one also thinks the Constitution is a good thing <laughs> and well-formed, then the original public meaning in constitutional terms will often uh, bring about sensible results, whether or not one is necessarily saying that as a matter of fact, so that, as it were, the, this founded or made or conventional document, if you want to put it this way, yeah. the Constitution, since it has so much merit, it's a risk worth, worth taking. At the end of the day, however, one has to understand the, the, the purposes of the regime and the way of life. One has to understand the links between the institution and the declaration. There is no substitute, I don't think, at the end of the day mm -hmm. for a true and proper understanding of uh, what these constitutional matters in particular mean. So I would put those things together and understand the reason why you get a certain uh, legalism or conventionalism and why people worry about runaway opinions mm -hmm. about justice. But ultimately, of course, if one were to pick one's perfect Supreme Court justice, it would be someone who hewed to uh, a teaching of original public meaning but went beyond that yeah. in the cases that it is absolutely necessary. Original public meaning or that kind of conventionalism is also a reasonable way often to interpret particular statutes. Sure. Um, though there may be limits there as well. So I think, as with all things, a degree of prudence, which also means remembering the importance of principle and our principles, is what one would uh, strive for. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you would want your Supreme Court justice uh, justice to be to have the rigor, sensibility, uh, moderation, uh, uh, and learning of a philosopher, <laughs> while, while of course recognizing that uh, in our in our system of government, they don't exercise the power of philosopher kings. Right? Yes, if you yeah. had Aristotle on the Supreme Court, <laughs> and if indeed you had. Uh, I would say six because you never know whether someone might fade in the wrong direction. Right. But at least six Aristotles, I think you would do reasonably well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, uh, unassailable. Well, for now, I think we'll leave it at that, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely have you back in the future. Good. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for listening to the interview. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org slash donate. And if you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at AmericanMind.org, Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewBooks.com, and our new Washington Center for the American Way of Life at DC.Claremont.org. Please rate, share, and subscribe to these podcasts, both to The Interview and The Roundtable and all of our podcasts at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to the production and engineering crew, Jake Gannon and Annalisa Lee. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.